everybody. Um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping because we've not had a Zoom meeting for quite a while. So just in case anyone's forgotten, we are recording the meeting so that we're able to put it up on the YouTube page um, in the next few days. Um, now, questions for Daniel. So the whole purpose of tonight is to allow us to quiz Daniel on, um, I suppose, stuff he talks about and any, any questions we've got. So please use the chat function, which for me is at the bottom of my screen. For everyone else, I'm not sure where it is. But if you uh, use the chat function, send your questions through to Troy. Um, they'll appear at Troy's end and Troy will then be able to work them into the uh, the presentation or the, or the talk as we go along. Um, and obviously, if you can have your camera on, providing you've got the appropriate bandwidth and everything's going well at your end, that would be appreciated because it does look a lot better when you see people's faces rather than blank screens with the odd name on it too. So um, if you had your camera on, that would be fantastic. Um, and as I said, if you can please leave yourself on mute, um, that will help as well. If you forget, then Ian will be... Uh, or mute you because obviously we don't want any background noise or phones ringing or kids wanting to go to bed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that sometimes happens. Um, so that's all I've got as introduction. Um, Daniel, thank you very much for making yourself available for our Zoom meeting tonight. It's been, um, it'll be greatly appreciated by the club and uh, you're certainly one name that we've had on our agenda for the last 18 months to get hold of. So um, thank you very much for freeing up some time in your calendar to uh, to allow Troy to uh, interview you tonight and, and share um, the knowledge that you've obviously built up over many years with us and hopefully allow us to pick your brains at some point throughout the, the next hour or so. So, Troy, I'll hand over to you. So, um, all good to go. Thank you. Um, I just want to let everybody know we did uh, attempt to go into Daniel's bird room, uh, Whitney's camera earlier today, and there are some 5G works going on uh, around his hometown there. He's on his Wi-Fi inside tonight. He's provided us some videos um, that I'm going to share with you. But going into the bird room, uh, the signal disappeared pretty quickly. So uh, unfortunately, as much as he cleaned everything up and he's very eager to get out there and show us the birds, um, we, we can't actually get out there today. So you'll be seeing some videos um, of some of the birds and the intent is that we're going to talk through uh, a lot of what Daniel's done now. So Daniel, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Well, what are you watching? Good evening. Troy, we've lost your sound. You've lost my sound. You don't appear to be on mute, but we've lost your sound. I, don't I can hear you. No. Yeah, I can. Go on. I'm, I can hear me. <laughs> I, can, I can hear him as well, Ian. I'm not sure what's happening on your end there, Ian, but um, yeah. I think Daniel can hear me, which is the most important thing. I can hear you, yeah. Perfect. All right. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, this is some snippets that Daniel's helped us put together. Um, courtesy of his friend, Pele, who graciously let us use a lot of these pictures today. So, Daniel, um, my first question for you is one that came uh, from Jeffrey Leong in Victoria. And I believe Jeffrey's visited you before, a uh, good friend of yours. Jeffrey was very keen to understand. Uh, he said, we cannot import birds into Australia and we haven't been able to since 1992. His question to you was, what should we do here to collect the material to be able to breed that modern budgerigar? Well, uh, uh, hello everyone. Uh, difficult question. I think that the question that uh, so again. Sorry, somebody had their thing off mute. You go. That oh, wasn't okay. me. Um, I said, I think that's a question that many or uh, hundreds of breeders from Australia are asking themselves for uh, yeah uh, thirty years yet now. Uh, uh, I could see interesting birds in 2014 when I came twice to Australia. Um, uh, some people had uh, some directional feathering, some people had the blow, some people had the good neck, the good shoulder. But uh, what I realized is that uh, Australian breeders 
do not really like to um, work together. I mean, uh, I have a group of friends that we are sharing birds. They're going around and uh, they can use my birds. I can use their birds. And uh, it's uh, giving and taking. And um, some breeders in Australia that I, I don't want to mention any names, but I told them to work together uh, because I could see that if they would work together, one of the breeders had some directional feathering in the feather in the face, and the other one had the good blow for the birds. And I said, you should uh, exchange birds and uh, you will see you will get good results. And, uh, and sometimes, uh, once, two, three years later, I asked, did you do that? And they said, no, it did not happen. <laughs> and they're friendly. But uh, each one prefers to do a little bit his own thing. And I, I realized that the hobby in channel in the Australia is much different. Uh, we in Switzerland, or let's say we in Europe, we uh, have lots of... Um, we are visiting each other. And if you want to buy uh, some birds, you give a call or you write a text message and uh, you ask the breeder, uh, can we make an appointment? I'm looking for some cinnamon opal in hands, for example. And then um, you make an appointment and you meet each other. And in Australia, that's completely different. You don't do that. Uh, even neighbors that live, well, neighbors in Australia are two hours, your neighbors. Even they don't visit each other, and uh, you have the auctions. Uh, well, I don't have to explain to you what the auctions mean, but for I, I didn't know that in Switzerland or in Europe, nobody is doing that, or I don't know about. And um, so you have a catalog, and there are the birds in with description, and uh, you buy the bird. But it's it's uh, I think it's very difficult or different if you buy a bird um, depending on pictures instead if you visit uh, starts and you see um, what birds are there and uh, um, maybe you see another bird and uh, normally you cannot buy the, the perfect bird but you can buy a certain feature let's say big spots or directional feathering or a good neck or anything and to go back to your question, I think, um, well, a big problem in Australia is that most birds that I really liked, they had a serious um, a ticket problem. So uh, um, I don't know where they came from, but in every start that I've seen and also on the show bench, many of the good birds have tickets. And uh, I don't, I, well, it's a major fault, but uh, I have in my store the very few ones, but uh, I would work with them for sure. But um, of course, you also have to avoid it. And I was surprised that even birds that are winning uh, had um, those flecking. But I think it would be possible uh, to create uh, a, bo a modern show bocce and um, if people would more exchange birds, but I mean, there's a lot of birds going around and they are sold, but uh, that people work together, I think that's not really happening. And I think that's why um, it's more difficult to make progress. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a good answer. Do you think that we have all of the ingredients here? That was Jeffrey's second question. Well, uh, uh, I, I, I've seen a grey green cock from an old, uh, Jeffrey will know the name, I don't remember. But Sorry, there's uh, somebody's off mute. Um, I saw there was a grey green cock from, um, I, I think he stopped and maybe he even died, but that was a very interesting bird. And uh, uh, he had, because he had directional feathering that you can see on, on that cinnamon spangle from before. For, uh, um, and I think that's, uh, that's the biggest difference. Uh, you see, most of my birds are having this directional feathering in the face and that makes the bird looks uh, quite different. And uh, that gray green cock had it and it was sold for huge price, I think for $8,000 Australian dollars. 
and uh, what's a huge amount of money. Anyway, the prices in Australia are very high. I when I see the pictures on uh, sometimes people send me pictures of what price the bird was sold to. And uh, the prices you're having in Australia are much higher than the prices we have here on the continent. But that's probably because we have much bigger choice or I don't know. But uh, it's, well, it's, I think it's possible, but it's, it's still a long way to do, a long way to go. And okay. uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned Jeffrey, I was visiting him and he certainly, when I see, he sends me regularly pictures of his birds and I can see that he's on a way to, on a good way. And, uh, but it's still, yeah, it's still, uh, for sure, it's more difficult to get birds in Australia than it's get for us where we can travel anywhere and uh, get certain features we are looking for. Yep, okay. Um, I was watching one of your old presentations and you talked about back in 2004, you visited somebody, I believe it was in South Africa, um, yeah. and you talked about at that time the big bird being the beautiful bird, and you saw, I think you mentioned these long tails, and you talked about bringing them back and obviously uh, created a different budgerigar with it. Uh, and obviously you went on to win European championships and those birds didn't have long tails. Curious to understand how you went about using that feature and then breeding that feature out of the birds at the same time. So you saw something in the bird, um, the, the size, and it came with a fault. And then you managed to breed a good bird out of it. Was it just selective pairings that you used for that? Well, I did not, the last question I didn't understand. The, the, the very last sentence, what was it? The, the strategy, did you use just, like were you very careful with your pairings, not to double up the, the long tail? Or did you? Oh, yeah, yeah. As I mentioned before, the flecking, it, it, uh, fleckings is a major fault, and having a tail that is too long or wings that are too long is also a major fault. Yep. And um, as most people know, I most of my pairings are love pairs, uh, or I try to either I see them in the flight and I pick them out. If they're not too close related, I take them or. If both birds ha have um, small spots, I don't put them together. I try to balance it. And of course, I would never pair two birds with longer tails or longer wings together because uh, you double up the fault. And it's, uh, with any fault, fleckies, don't put flecked birds together because you fix it. And um, those birds from South Africa, I think I bought 13 birds and six or seven of them did breed about half of them and I kept very uh, I kept every single youngster of them I didn't sell anything and with those birds I continued some of the birds were older and died soon but with those birds I could see that um, in the gene of those birds there's an extra length of feather and uh, I mean in South Africa I went there in 2000 the first time um, that was after the death of my mother. Uh, I went traveling in the south of Africa in different countries and I made a stop also at Reinhard Molkotin's place. And um, I, I was wondering um, whether it, it's possible to get that extra length of feather uh, in a different, uh, if you have a head feather that is longer, it looks nice. If you have a body feather that is too, too long, it, it doesn't look nice. And wing, too long wings and tails, it's not nice either. And birds can't fly properly anymore. And um, yeah, when I was young, I was learning that from each pair, you should have 16 youngsters uh, because then you have the full, uh, maybe I can show you what I mean. Um, the mathematical right. probability? Yes, I, um, I make something very primitive and um, wait. Um, so I don't know, can you see that? So these are 16 four by four different um, um, possibilities. And let's say um, you have a hen with certain features and you have a cock with certain features 
and um, you want to, um, if you pair them together, let's say words that in like, so that's the, 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 the features that are coming from the cock and here are the features coming from the hen. And if you have 16 youngsters, you have different uh, possibilities. Here is a lot of, um, let's say these birds from here, they look, they have a small head and long wings and tails. That's the worst you can get. And these birds here, they have long um, um, uh, feathers in the face, but short um, tails and wings. And uh, so from, or when you put a opaline, a flecked opaline to a normal um, bird with small spots, you will get a certain amount of birds that have, um, that are ticked and having small spots. That's what you don't want, get rid of them. But you will also get birds that are clean with big spots. And these ones, you, you go on, you have to go on. I'm not sure whether you could follow. Uh, no, no, my... I follow exactly. That was a very good explanation. Okay. And it's it's all about selection. And um, if you select, you you are the master. You can say in which direction you want to go. And if you, um, go, let's say spots. If you say I want to have uh, big spots, that means big spots means you have a wide feather, a wide round feather. And um, if you go on with um, always every year, big spots, big spots, big spots. And uh, after a few generations, let's say after five generation, you will realize that most of your birds are having bigger spots. So then you were able to fix a feature. And I think nowadays it's still for most people, it's still the, the face that takes the attraction. Uh, but I think many people are too much fixed on the face. And I mean, uh, if I'm, uh, I've, if I, I really don't spend much time on social media and I, I really cannot do it exactly. I don't know how it works. But what I want to say is that uh, when you see the pictures on social media, it, you always just see the head, huge heads, boom. And um, you don't see the rest of the bird, but it's also very important the position above the, the perch, the position of the wing, and so on. And uh, on, on Facebook, you just see a face, and most of the time the picture is made like this, very close to the to the camera, and then the head looks huge. And but you don't see does the feather has a uh, the, the bird has a tail or does he grows a cyst or whatever. You just see the head, and if you take a picture like this, my head is also now much, much bigger than the rest of the body, but that makes a complete wrong impression. That's also why I would never buy a bird um, um, for a lot of money without seeing uh, the bird in real, because sometimes, um, yeah, a bird uh, can look much better than he, than, than he really is just because of the camera. If you make like this, now my hand is huge, but it's not, now my hand is small, but it's just the camera, the perspective of the camera. That's, oh, can you just go back quickly? I uh, can. Is that possible? Um, freezing it up. But that, yeah, that's a bird, um, what I would call to be very ugly. <laughs> uh, but uh, many people still think, can you go back? Um, they would say, ah, oh, that's a super bird, that's a super bird. But for me, it's it's not, it's, uh, can you stop it? The picture, is that possible? Yep. I, I mean, it's, uh, um, you know, it's it's flecked. The, the feather is not, it's not closed. It's not a dense feather. And uh, if you, you don't see the, um, you don't see the, the, the body feathers, they should start to stay together. And on that bird, it's a double buff. It's a hen. She's a good breeding hen, actually. I have more than 10 chicks from her. Most of the time, birds like this don't breed properly. But it's always a risky game. If you have a hen that breeds like this, of course, you can make uh, huge progress. But that, that's, for me, an example of... It's not it just it's not a show bird. It's, a, it's an interesting bird, but it's, it's, uh, it shouldn't be shown. 
because uh, also when you see the feathers on the left and the right, and uh, it's everywhere a little bit a mess. But if I would put that picture on uh, Facebook, uh, I, I never do that. But if I would, I would get hundreds of uh, people would say super bird, oh, mashallah, mashallah, super, super, super. But I think it's, it's uh, he also, she, that hen has no tail, for example. Uh, you don't see that, but um, and it's, it's typical that birds with those faces, with those extreme feathers have no tail. And a bird like this never can be shown. And uh, when I go to a show, many people are always saying, ah, oh, um, my very best birds, uh, I couldn't bring them. They were not in condition. That's what everybody's saying. But that's also certain birds, like that, that, that style of bird. Um, they're all the year, more or less, uh, in molt. They never, um, and uh, uh, my cinnamon Gregory in the European show winner that won twice, he was a bird I could have shown him the whole, the whole year. He always looked nice and you never saw him really molting. That was very fascinating. And that kind of feather, they're always molting a little bit. That's why they're never in condition. It's not because, okay, at, then, at that moment is the show and uh, um, the bird is not in condition because that style of bird, they're never in condition. Or let's say they're never fed a complete. There are always a few feathers um, growing and uh, that's, that's in the genes. It's, it's, it, yeah, it's not bad luck. It's just a genetic problem, I would say. And uh, So Daniel, I question would, for you. The you obviously don't like the feathers around the, the feet of the bird um, hanging over the perch. Where do you like the longer feathers on the bird? Well, more in the face, of in course. In the cap, in the mask, uh, but, uh, or just the cap? Or in the mask. I That's that's probably the first feature I was looking for when I was, I don't know, 18, 90, 20. I, I started to like birds with a deep mask. And the bird with a deep mask means nothing else than a bird. The bird has long feathers. If a bird has a short mask, then the whole feathers uh, on the bird will be um, short. And um, so I was really using a lot of birds with uh, long mask. That was the first. No, the first si feature was size, getting bigger birds, bigger birds. <laughs> Just big, big. And afterwards, I was looking for changing the, 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 the length of the mask. And uh, yeah, later I started to look for the directional feathering. And I think that was what made the difference. You see on those babies already, um, the, especially the cinnamon, uh, that the feather are going from the beak. You already see that on the babies, that the feathers are going sidewards down and that makes the bird looks uh, different more myesthetic okay um daniel you talked about changing the birds in your ideal bird um you mentioned at one point that you didn't like much of the openness in the cap um you preferred a much denser cap on the budgerigar um can you tell us a little bit a bit more about this and why you don't like it well, because it's not beautiful. Let's take that cinnamon. He, that was that's one of the birds that I never was able to show, and uh, now he's uh, four years old and uh, he's not feather complete anymore. On the, on one wing he was losing some feathers, and I think they don't grow back. But uh, if you can show him again, you see. Yeah. Can you stop? Can you stop now? Oh, uh, so from here he looks nice. But he's not 100% in condition now. But already um, on the top of the head, you see there there are uh, how do you say gaps, uh, yep. missing feathers, and uh, the birds I really like, and I think these are the true show winners. They should have a little blow, but not um, not too much. Um, I think when it's too much, it's ugly. Uh, and if you can see sidewards, you can see uh, through the feathers, then I think it's, uh, yeah, it's like a kakadu. In Australia, you have plenty of kakadus and they play with the... The cockatoos, yes. Yep. Uh, cockatoos. 
with the uh, but that's something else and uh, i remember i saw that feature the first time at doc saddler's place i was i was visiting him in 1996 uh, that was during the european um, football um, championship i was visiting him with my bicycle with a friend together and he's dead now, very nice um, guy, but his, his head, the birds were very narrow, really not, I didn't like them. But uh, can you stop the, can you stop quickly? Yeah. Uh, no, it's, I just want to say, um, have a look, as it's not ideal when the feathers, he's, he's, he was not 100% in condition here. When he's 100% in condition, you actually can't see through. But I just to explain, if it's too much blow and you can see through, it's no good. That's what I want to say. And the birds from Doc Sadler, they were quite narrow, but they all had this, uh, this feather coming down. And I, I, I was looking at this and I thought that's interesting. And later there was a guy called uh, Wilson that was able to fix that features. And I was getting birds um, also from that bloodline. And uh, uh, certainly I also, you see, could you see what I mean? Uh, a yes. certain blow is nice, but not too much. That's what I wanna say. Okay, let's stop. <laughs> talk about, let's talk about something else. No, no, that's okay. Um, tell us about your theory behind size and fertility. Uh, the bigger the bird, what do you see yeah. with the fertility? Well, you already answered the bird, uh, the question more or less. Uh, but that's that's an example. That's a, um, he's quite fertile. That that gray green guy, for example, or that cinnamon gray is very fertile. He's now also again on five or six fertile eggs, uh, but he's not super big. He's uh, but the gray green from before, he's really big. Um, well. To make it easy, um, the, I, I know a guy from Switzerland, he breeds the small botches, the color botches, and uh, I've never visited him, but I was told that in every box when you open the five chicks, four chicks, six chicks, seven chicks, all eggs fertile, he has the small color botchy, and I think botches in general are made from nature to be very, very fertile. And uh, when we always pair bigger birds together and make them bigger and bigger, I think um, somehow you lose the fertility. And, uh, and I mean, what people in Europe are doing, and I'm sure it's also done in, by uh, breeders in Australia, is then to use artificial insemination. But as I told many times, I think it's silly. It's the wrong way. When a bird is not able to produce, reproduce himself, I think we, um, yeah, we're doing something wrong. And uh, when I see birds mating um, in the cage, uh, I think, yeah, that's funny. That's uh, that's that's natural. And um, you know, this, by the way, this pair, this this hen, the first year, she didn't go. She didn't lay an egg. And I thought, well, let's uh, forget her. I wanted to give her away. And uh, that cock from uh, before, the cinnamon spangle, I tried him with different hens that I liked. Uh, and he didn't like, he was, he was no interested in none of them. And then later I saw him with that hen and I said, well, let's try, let's put them together. And they produced me uh, nine chicks last year in two rounds. And uh, yeah, and uh, that's also a hen. Let's say from 10 hens in that size, five are not breeding or almost not breeding. And one or two are breeding uh, a few chicks. And then you have uh, one or two out of 10 hens like this that are really breeding well. That's a hen that is really breeding well. And uh, you don't see that, uh, but normally big hens um, are difficult, are more difficult to breed, and you lose um, fertility. Big hens lose le are laying less eggs, and I think the breeding, the the, the cycle of uh, cocks being fertile, 
is uh, also getting shorter if the birds are too big. So if you realize you have a problem with fertility, you should start using uh, smaller, smaller birds as well. Don't make the birds too big. If the birds cannot fly anymore, it's no good. You're going too far. I, I did notice, Daniel, you talked about back in 2010, 2011, that um, your daughter mentioned about the birds not being able to fly and you had a realization and you changed your tactics in the breeding room. Was it just in selective pairings that you you went back the other way to make sure that all the birds can fly? Just through well, the of pairs? As I told you already before, there are two important periods. First, how do you pair your birds together? Um, and, um, and afterwards, which birds you keep for breeding? So if you always just keep the, the big birds, your birds will become bigger and bigger and also lose fertility and so on. And uh, if you only use the, the, the small, uh, the beautiful color ones, uh, you will get very attractive colors, but the birds will become smaller and smaller. So you always have to balance the, 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 the color and you have the size and uh, it's always a balance through everything. And uh, yeah, I mean, in general, I tried to make, or I, I did, I wanted to get back from the feather. I mean, all those big birds that can't fly anymore, they simply have too much um, um, feathers. And I think in Australia, you, I, I think I, I haven't seen any long tails or anything like this. I was told that the birds came originally from a guy called Manichini, and he had them from some UK breeders. And he took them to South Africa and he fixed them and uh, yeah, it was uh, a genetic uh, default or how, I don't know how to say, but um, when you make the selection and you always just keep the big ones and get rid of the small ones, uh, your birds are getting too big. You have to find a balance um, to get, you don't want small birds, you, but you also don't want big monster birds that cannot fly. And uh, of course, I started to sell a lot of the big ones and kept more of the small ones. And after this, I'm not at the point yet where I want to be. I really would like to have a flight full of birds that are able to fly and I don't have it. I also have birds that cannot fly, uh, but I'm on the way of, on that. And I mean, when you visit the start and 80, 90% are sit, of the birds are sitting on the floor, um, most of those birds cannot fly. And uh, I mean, we are breeding budgies and not chicken. Chicken are sitting on the floor and cannot fly properly. But we, our birds, say from the nature, they are able to fly. I mean, if you look at pictures from budgies in the wild, they are fantastic flyers. You, it's difficult to catch them. And our birds say, <laughs> yeah, it's not that difficult to catch them. But it, it, it's all about selection. If you uh, only breed birds that cannot fly, you will get youngsters that cannot fly. No, good answer. Um, one question I notice in amongst here, there's a lot of cinnamons and cinnamon opalines that make up your stud. Why is it important to have these in your stud? And are there any features that are connected with this variety? Um, well, the, I remember the first hen that was really showing this uh, directional feathering. It was a cinnamon opaline gray green hen of mine. She was a small bird, but she looked different. And uh, she was very fertile and uh, I kept the youngsters. And whenever I saw anywhere on a show or when I was visiting someone, when I saw a bird that had this feature, I tried to buy it. And uh, the more I, I had from those birds, the more um, you fix it. And nowadays, I think, yeah, almost all my birds have this feature above the eyes, more or less. And so I was able to fix it. I mean, I'm, I'm breeding budgies for more than 40 years. And let's say I breed yeah about 35 years i breed seriously budgies 
and um, try to change certain things and uh, um, yeah. Is, is so, there any pairings that you try and avoid, Daniel? Uh, I know you mentioned one, at one this, point this, this, great to this, great. Pairing, this one, that's, uh, can you go back? Sure. That's, uh, uh, that they already have been together as babies. I could not remember. And uh, I, I uh, tried to avoid this pairing, uh, but finally I put them together because I was not able to get the hand breeding and I was not able to go get the cock breeding of another bird. So I put them together before we went to holiday. They had clear eggs <laughs> to make it short, but that's... An an example of a bird of vision. They're too big, too similar. It lacks uh, style. And um, yeah, but sometimes I, uh, I said, okay, let's try it. But when you have love pairings, they, they in general much, um, yeah, you have less trouble with fightings or uh, yeah, with the birds or they don't kill the chicks or whatever, they don't attack the chicks. That all can happen with other pairings. Daniel, what do you do if you put a pair together and the hen goes straight in the box and she doesn't come out to mate with the cockbird? Uh, I, I throw her out and I closed, uh, closed. I don't have this problem anymore, but I used to have it as well. Uh, and. Uh, I was using uh, uh, any kind of um, uh, carton or newspapers to put between the, the nest box and uh, the wire. And uh, I don't do that anymore, but I, um, I, I was putting, I put out the hens in the evening and uh, I put loud music on. <laughs> My younger years, I was listening to heavy metal and the birds, uh, they quite like that. And uh, music is for sure, as it's for human beings, it's a stimulation. Or what they also um, like is uh, when the hoover, the hoover is on, they, they, go, they get quite horny somehow. And <laughs> if you take the, hen, the hands out and she cannot go into the nest box and make the hoover on or any music, any kind, they like noise. They like it to be, they have noisy. And in, in my bird rooms, they're always around 400, 450, or up to maximum 500 birds. Um, it's, it's quite noisy. And um, the architect I was working with when we made the construction, and he was in my bird room, he said, that we have to make uh, kinds too noisy. And uh, I mean, I don't think that are, all my friends don't like the birds. They think it's silly what I'm doing, but that's okay. But if they come into the bird room, they say, oh, it's so no it's noisy. How can you stand that? That's terrible. But I'm sure the birds are loving it when it's noisy. And that's why I don't do something to support the noise, but I didn't make any, um, any uh, kind of building uh, construction things to avoid the noise, because I'm sure, I'm 100% sure it's stimulating. And also, I don't understand also in Australia, most dots I've seen, they all keep hens and cocks separated and young birds and old birds separated. I have no idea what that should be good for because in nature, they're all together. And if a young bird comes into the flight, at the, at the beginning, he's at the bottom of the, of the ranking and he has to fight to get bigger. And maybe one or two years later, he's, a, he's the boss in there. But I think that's more or less uh, natural. And in general, I try to make everything as natural as possible. And in, 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 the, in the wild, I'm sure not young hens uh, stay together and young cocks stay together. And, uh, the adult birds stay together. The old, it's a folk of budgies. It's a big mixture of everything. And um, yeah, so that's why you should try to keep them together. And whenever they, you saw sometimes a love pair, the, the, the two Lutinos from before, for example, 
Um, whenever I see a pair like this, I quickly check the pedigree, Lutinos, I don't know all the birds, most of the norm, those birds here, the normal color birds, I know them all by heart, I know their pedigree, I know, I don't know the ring numbers, but I know the pedigree of them. But with the Lutinos, I have to check where they come from, and if they're not too close to related, I let them breed. And as long as the birds have a good genetic background, you can be sure that some of the youngsters will have um, top quality again. Okay. Um, that's, that's, that's also a love pairing. Um, that's a young cock with that gray, with that they are together and they are um, yeah, too far now. Uh, they bred uh, two super chicks now. I just came home from holiday and in the nest there were two super cinnamon gray green and normal gray green. And uh, yeah, that's uh, it's a, it was a love pairing and it worked. Only two. When it comes to breeding, Daniel, what's your experience with breeding close? Well, when I was young, I also made close breeding pairs. Um, it's a short way to fix certain things. If you pair father to daughter, mother to son, half sisters, cousin to cousin, uh, and um, you multiply all the good features what you want but you also always multiply all the bad features and i realized that uh, some birds um, when they they are bred too close that um, um, when they have a diary um, a normal bird i clean a little bit and sometimes i give something or i don't give anything at all and the, the bird is strong enough with his immune system to fight against it and uh, no problem. <clears throat> and birds that are bred too close, they are not strong enough to fight against a certain uh, kind of disease and they die. And, and you also lose fertility and you also lose... Um, I remember when I was a kid, I had a, a pinnick, pinny, pinny kick, how do you say? Guinea, the small, small animal. It's the guinea pig. It's like a rat, but not. Tales from South America. Guinea pig, years old. I got one. We bought it. It's a lady, and she was getting more and more fat, really. And I said, "Ooh!" <laughs> and then suddenly she uh, she had babies, and uh, that was for me like. A miracle, and uh, obviously that mini pig was pregnant, and um, and she had some daughters and some so sons, and I had no idea, and I thought it's funny, and some I gave away. And they, uh, the mother was pregnant. And uh, I had lots of mini pigs, and everyone in our area, uh, <laughs> all the kids had to take mini pigs from me. But what I was realizing, that's what I say, they all were certain. I know that if, with mice, if science with mice, they, they, it's, different device and everything but with mini pigs so to make it short about short about your question i would not recommend to make close relations close matings close relation to them okay parents better i stay in the family i i know when i grew up everyone said you have to put a cousin to cousin that's the best pairing but but I think it's always too close. Human beings, you're not allowed to marry you, um, your cousin because uh, you can think the Pochis is more or less the same. Understood. Um, tell me, do you think you need opalines to breed good budgerigars? Yes, 
Why? But people over here, and not people, but openings over here have a bad reputation. When people come to my bedroom and they see, let's say, normal um, black green cock, they ask, can I buy him? I said, I have to check it, maybe. And then I say, oh, the mother was an opaline gray hen. They said, oh, no, no, no opaline, no opaline, no split opaline. And then I always know that guy has no idea about breeding budgies. I mean, most of my birds are split cinnamon and opaline. And of course, you have to handle it. Uh, if you don't be careful, you you will end up with only opalines and cinnamons and you have always to make a selection to get the normals going. But I would recommend to pair opalines to opalines. That's how you get the nice, the, the nice, uh, the V on the back. And uh, if you always pair normals to opaline, you risk to get uh, normal birds that have the opalism. Do you say opalism? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the opalism. Maybe that's the reason why um, people uh, don't like them too much. But I think in general that uh, opalines also for the spots are an important feature. And I, I love to work with opaline cinnamon hens. Um, as I told before already a few times, I think I don't have one single bird, uh, one single hen with cinnamon opaline uh, that has a feather trouble, I'm sure. Cinnamon opaline seems to have stronger feathers structure somehow. And uh, yeah, I, I like them, but um, certain people completely dislike them. Talk, talking about that, um, what are your thoughts about flicking? Do you think that it's a, an issue with excess melanin and do you use them? Um, well, I, I wanted to get a few good flecked birds with big spots this year, but so far I was not able. Um, I, realized, I realized that my spots used to be better. Uh, my recessive, here you see a recessive cock. Uh, in general, my recessive still have very big spots, and I'm sure that's still going back to the Molkatin birds I brought in in early 2000s. Um, Reinhardt birds, they had uh, the best spots that I've ever seen. That's a feature that he, that was dominant in his bird room, big round spots. And um, that let, let's take this hen, she looks nice, but birds with that face, they, um, can you go back? Yes, that one. Um, birds like this, um, most birds that have this face, have quite um, uh, average sized spots. And if the spots would be bigger, then the hen would be looking much nicer. She's having two chicks at, at the moment with the melanistic gray green spangle you've seen before, and uh, that's a perfect uh, combination. But birds with big spots often have not a nice face. Somehow it seems to be linked. Uh, but birds with big spots uh, most of the time have no feather troubles and birds with small faces, uh, small spots and nice faces, these are the birds that have feather troubles. It's somehow linked. Okay. And uh, to go back to your question, I mean, that's, that hen has some tickets, uh, but of course I will use it. But it's, it's, it's uh, I think um, flecking is an interesting feature uh, I, I like to use black birds to put into the bangles to get better markings on the wings because what are flecking, it's, um, it's too much of melanin in, at the wrong place. And again, when I think about this one, you will get, if you use a flecked bird into the spangles, you will get flecked spangles with poor markings but you also will get a certain amount of birds that have uh, good markings and no flecking. And these are the ones you want to continue with. Okay. You can work yeah. with it, don't make it that it's getting too many. Daniel, watching you talk about the video of your birds, it's very clear that you know almost all of your birds and their parentage. How important do you think it is for the fancier to know his, his or her birds? Well, I think that's the key. <laughs> uh, and, well, I don't make many uh, budgie 
visits anymore, but I remember when I was younger, I, I, I went to visit many, many people and also some big names. And I asked, uh, how did that bird breed? He said, I don't know. And this one, uh, I don't know. Sorry, we've somehow muted you, Daniel. You just want to put yourself off mute. I don't know what's happened there. You, you put oh, me on you're back. Thank you. We heard Close. that you went and visited somebody and that uh, they didn't know if a bird had bred and then didn't know if another bird had bred and then you cut out. Exactly. The, bird, the people seemed not to like, uh, not to know whether the bird was um, breeding or not. And I think that, uh, yeah, you have to know that. Uh, and I know... You also have to know how long, how old is this hen and uh, when was he breeding the last time. I think it's very important that you work uh, with birds that uh, are completely re recovered. I know pe uh, people that are using a hen four, five, six, seven, eight times uh, until she one day she's dead. But uh, I use hens like this at my place they work normally two rounds plus maybe if they're still in condition i make a third round and take the eggs away but uh yeah to go back to your question it's very important to 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 know your birds and if you don't know them you're having too too many of them you should know also the pedigree about i mean um that's also love pairing Mousy, hi. Wieso bist du heute, Claudia? Ich habe ich ha keine Zeit, ich habe ein Meeting. My daughter just came home, but she shouldn't. <laughs> she should be uh, at her friend's place, because always on Tuesday. And uh, yeah, well, I don't know what she's doing. I forgot your question. What was it? We were, we were talking about the, uh, the attention to detail and knowing your birds, but I think you did a very good job of answering it. So I'll, I'll ask you another one that's come through. Can you tell us your thoughts on fostering chicks from your best pairs? Do you think it's a good idea or should your best birds feed their young? My best birds, when they have youngsters, they feed them. Uh, no, I think it's even a very bad idea. It's the same like artificial insemination. I know many of the top stocks in Europe are doing that, artificial insemination and fostering pairs. That means from each pair they take the eggs away and give it to the small bodies and they grow the chicks and uh, I mean imagine what you're doing if if um, you have you're having kids and always after birth the, the kid is taking away and I think birds can get mad of it and uh, yeah as I told you I, I like happy birds and uh, I'm sure they have uh, like we have more or less uh, a, a, a genetic uh, preposition to to get to to breed youngsters, and uh, that's why I think it's important that um, that you leave birds uh, together and let them feed the chicks their own. Maybe uh, you know some years ago everybody wanted to see the cinnamon gray green of mine, and sometimes they were surprised if he uh, he was feeding four chicks. And uh, but that was not nothing special. I just think it's important that um, bird can follow their natural instincts. And uh, that's also an interesting um, picture. Uh, I started a few years ago to give my birds toys to play with. And uh, yeah, that's something that most birds are loving it. Not just the baby birds, also the adults. And uh, with that one, they, they uh, sometimes they try to jump on it and they try to keep the balance. And it's a big uh, challenge uh, who is able to, to put it off like this, you see, and then you fly at the top. That's, uh, yeah, I think in many starts, there's just nothing. They have um, um, the purchase and nothing else. And I mean, what should birds do the whole day long if they don't have nothing to play? And uh, I mean, there's hundreds of articles about how you have to feed chicks and about antibiotics and probiotics and vitamins and supplements. Uh, that's all okay. But I think we should put much more attention 
on um, the social beha behavior of birds. It's more important, well, I, I, to make it easy, um, happy birds breed better. And uh, I try to make my birds happy uh, with the intention that they breed more and better youngsters. Oh, that makes good sense. Tell me, you've got a lot of branches in the breeding cages and in the aviaries. How do you avoid contamination coming into the bird room, like from wild bird droppings and things like that? Well, that risk always exists. I mean, uh, you also can bring mites in, red mites that are very awful. But I have since a few years a superb product called Exalt. I don't know whether you have that as well in uh, the Australia. That's a medication that you put very small amount of it into the water. You give it two days and then uh, a week later again, two days and then four or five months, you have not one single night anymore. And it's not dangerous for the babies or whatever. Uh, but um, of course you have, uh, if, you if you bring wild branches in, uh, you also bring in uh, any kind of little animals or whatever. It's also possible to bring any disease in, but well, I'm doing that since 40 years and so far it did not happen. But uh, I can just, birds are loving it. If we go afterwards to the bird room, uh, I just gave fresh branches in this morning and uh, they like to eat it, they like to play it. If they are wet, they like to take a shower in the leaves. And um, it's just uh, part of their social uh, behavior. And uh, that I think they must have fre fresh um, leaves. And I, I use, my, my birds love um, willows the most. They also like other hazelnut or apple tree or whatever, but the favorite is for sure willows. I also okay. tried eucalyptus because I know that in Australia they are using eucalyptus, but my birds, I, I'm working with an institute, with a gardenery, they, they produce a different kind of eucalyptus for zoos, for pandas, of course, and things like this. And I, I tried them as well at my place, but my birds are not too eager for eucalyptus. I don't know why. Okay. Um, I noticed, I, I read somewhere that you change the water between four and seven times a day. Is that correct? Especially in summer times. It depends whether I'm around. Well, now I've been in holiday and I had people who were looking after the birds and uh, one of the, the, the water changer is a girl that next, lives in the neighborhood. She's a student. And uh, it depends how much time does she have. And uh, um, but I try, you know, I I also have drinkers for the big bottles for the birds. But most birds they love to take a shower in the in the water in the in the plate of water. But they also at the same time they shit into the water. And uh, as long as the birds are all healthy, it's not a problem. But if you have one single bird that is sick and they shit in the water and you don't change it uh, a few weeks later, a few days later, you will have, or you can have a serious problem. So I try to change it a lot, yes. Okay. Um, I did read also, you mentioned about trying to avoid touching the babies when they're very little uh, for passing on infections. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I mean, one of the biggest problem in the start is always um, French mold, I guess. And uh, French mold is a virus. I didn't know that it also exists in the wild. When I made, um, um, I wanted to visit uh, Bocchis in the wild with John Scoble. I think many people will know him. Hello, Joe. John, if you should listen to me or hear it. Um, and with Mick Lea. We wanted to see wild budgies, but uh, we haven't seen not one single one uh, in, the mo in the few months I was in Australia. I saw thousands of other parrots, but not no budgies. But they told me that in the wild, they also have the French mold virus, but the nature, uh, they fall down from the nest and uh, on the bottom, 
they get eaten and uh, it's finished. But I think um, French mold in most uh, starts, it's a serious problem. And as it's a, a virus, um, how do you give a further a virus? It's most like Corona. We were not a, allowed to use our hands anymore. We say like this, hello, and not like this anymore. And I think if we have a, a nest with infection, and uh, we go to the other nest and we are doing we are the ones who are spreading around the, the virus and that's why i try to avoid i don't clean my hand from every nest <laughs> to the next one i have 90 breathing cabinets i don't wash my hand 90 times but i just it's not necessarily i just look in everything okay maybe i use a, a millet uh, to not to touch the baby, just to see is the, the fourth or fifth one, is it also fat? And uh, then I go to the next one. And of course, when I have to put on the rings, um, um, yeah, sometimes I use a toilet paper for each bird that uh, like this, you don't touch them either. But uh, use, um, you should use a, a spray for disinfection of the hand and uh, yeah, don't touch too many times the, the birds. Okay. What, what do you do, Daniel, for a breeding strategy to oh. avoid feather problems? Do you do you bring in outcrosses to try and keep the birds not close? Is that what you do for, for things like yeah. cysts and tails and things like that? I try to bring in every year 15, 20 birds uh, just because um, to be sure that the uh, uh, you don't get too close related and uh, well i mean to avoid feather problems is uh, if you don't breed with feather troubles you still get them but uh, i'm surprised that also <laughs> the guys that make artificial insemination they use a cock huge head but a big lump on the on the back of the tail and they still use his sperms and said, "Ah, oh, not the, the youngsters don't uh, get the, the get, get the problem." But I'm sure um, if it doesn't come out in the first or second generation, it will come out in the third or fourth generation. So I would never use a bird like this. And um, so whatever you bring into the bird comes out again sooner or later. Maybe not in that in the direct offspring, but probably in the third or fourth generation uh, from the cousin side. So everything comes back. And uh, if you work a lot with birds with uh, feather troubles, you will get a certain amount or a big amount with feather trouble. So don't do it. Don't use them. I have at the moment a huge cinnamon gray green hen, but she has a cyst at the back. I mean, her face is, she's the best hen in my, well, she's the hen with the biggest head. But uh, I, ciao, Mausi, bis am Fieri. Tschüss. My daughter. Um, she has to go back to school. Simply don't use birds with, that's, uh, that's really, you can use birds with flackies or whatever, no problem. But don't use birds with cysts because, uh, it's, a, I think, the biggest fault uh, that the bird can have. Okay. Do you think there's any connection, talking about long feathers, do you believe there's any connection at all between long feathers and the cold winters that are experienced up in the Northern Hemisphere? Or do you think we should be able to breed that down here just by correct selection of the birds, of the pairs? I didn't understand. You think it, the long feathers are connected with the weather? Fe with the weather, weather, as in somebody asked about the cold weather and they, they believe that maybe in Europe it's so cold uh, that budgies grow longer feathers than they do in Australia. Uh, no, I mean, if you know how um, nature is working, um, nature is working perfectly. Nature is making everything the way it should. And uh, of course, uh, animals that live in the, in the cold area, they have better protection against it, but that doesn't happen in a few generations, that happens in thousands of years. And uh, I mean, our bocchis, I think they came over in 1980, no, 1849, 1844, as far as I know. 
And uh, so that's not even 200 years ago, the first bocces from Australia came into Europe. And uh, of course, it's amazing um, how birds change in that short period. But I think that's mostly because uh, human, uh, humans started to, let's say, interfere into the pedigrees and uh, made the selection. But it's not because uh, the weather is cold and uh, uh, let's say uh, you keep your birds always on five to 10 degrees temperature. It's possible to do that. But I don't think uh, you will see after 10 years that the birds have more feather length. I know maybe after 2000 years or something like this, but not after a few generations. Okay. Um, other than a love pairing in your aviary, um, it seems like a lot of the pairs that you have are two different colors and two different feather types. Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, um what do you mean also i think you know some people are surprised that uh, they see in my shirt a lot of different types of birds and uh, they they i mean the birds the pictures of the birds they see are from the on the show bench most of my birds look similar let's say similar not the same but similar and they, then they came the first time into my shed and they are surprised that birds look quite different. I mean, I have small birds, I have big birds, I have birds with long feathers, I have, I have yellow or medium feathered birds. And I, I always say breeding bocces is like um, um, uh, playing a jigsaw, putting a jigsaw together. And I think it's important to have the different uh, type of feathers to it's always the you always the goal is always to create the perfect budgie and uh, if you have um, not the opposite to play with it's it's more difficult but of course i have more and more birds that are let's say average sized and uh, more or less birds with show quality when i was younger i had much more let's say big hens uh, big cocks and smaller hens and put them together but more and more, I have more birds that are more or less uh, balanced. And so that you don't have to look for um, the opposite because they already, they don't have any big fault. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's good to have um, um, different looking birds. Okay. Um, one of the questions that came through on the chat uh, just now, somebody was asking if you could clarify in terms of breeding relatives together, what you consider is too close. Is father to daughter too close? Is brother to sister too close? Obviously, yes. Um, is cousins too close? I think so, yeah. Too close. I don't do it. Well, uh, you know, some years ago, I had um, a pied grey green. He was winning best pied of Switzerland. And he was fighting in the flight with some other birds. And then I put him to another flight and he started to attack a sky blue hen. And I said, well, okay, let's put them together. And they bred one of the best birds I ever bred. They bred me a dark green cock, outstanding bird. That was in 2004 or 2005. That bird, the picture of this bird is still somehow around that bird was better and bigger than anything else at that time i could never show him he was losing already soon uh, some flights in one wing but it was a super bird and i put he was the the father of all my good cinnamons i had afterwards he was fertile and i bred i don't know three 30 40 chicks in four or five years from that bird but what i want to say is that i checked later when the, the uh, when the bird, the quality was so good, I checked the pedigree of the hen, and I realized it was a daughter from the cock. I didn't, I, I couldn't remember, and he looked, she looked completely different. And uh, I had in that family, I never had any um, inbreeding um, problems afterwards. So that's an example of um, uh, it was going well. 
but in general, I had some years before I, I was getting two dilute cocks from a, from, from a friend of mine. And I, I tried to build a family of dilutes and that worked well at the beginning. But uh, after a few generation, um, all the birds were too close related because they all went back to, do, to these two birds. And uh, I lost a lot, the family more or less died out as they all, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I realized I was too close and I told myself that that problem will never gonna happen to me anymore. Okay. Um, Daniel, when you did your presentation back here in Adelaide in 2014, you talked about shifting the location of the eye of the budgerigar slightly backwards. Can you talk us through um, what you did there to try and change the appearance? Well, uh, can you stop the, the picture that we've just seen? Sure. I, I want to see, okay, well, uh, you cannot see my hand here, but to, to explain it that um, when you put the eyes of the bird more backwards, uh, you change the whole physiognomy of the head and um, birds uh, that I don't like, they have the eye very close to the beak and uh, they also have no back head, no, no back skull. And if you change the position of the eye more sidewards, uh, you change also the, the, the head and uh, those birds um, are looking nice. But uh, I want to say it's very important that also for concerning the eyes that if you breed such a long feather that the bird cannot see, watch properly, look, take that bird again. Can you stop when the, can you go a little bit or stop, stop? Uh, you see, let's say that, that cinnamon old plain hen at the top, from the side, you must see the, the eye perfectly. And if you cannot see it, you're gone too far. And uh, when, yeah, so I, I remember I read once a crest, a full circle crest, that, but his feather was going like this, he couldn't see anymore. And uh, well, many people said that's the best crest in the world and things like this, but I sold him to Arabia somehow because uh, he, it was too far. The bird couldn't see. You had to cut the eye at uh, the, the feathers that he was able to see. And that was, of course, a complete nonsense. So also that feature that the eye must um, stay free is important. Back at that same presentation, Daniel, you talked about um, at the time buying 100 outcrosses and only, a hun uh, only five of those 100 might take you forward. Have you found well, that over the years that's I, improved? The, the <laughs> ratio has improved now? Did I say so? I don't remember. What I want to say is I bought in my life, well, I think in the meantime, probably thousands of birds, but certainly hundreds of birds, okay? And uh, most of the birds I bought were wasted time and wasted money, and um, they were no good. But if you buy 30 birds uh, or 10 birds or whatever, you don't, if you only buy one bird, yeah, you must be very lucky that that bird breeds well and breeds the features you were looking for. Um, but uh, if you breed more birds, you have more chance to, uh, but it's just, you don't know which bird are the birds that bring you forward if you, if you bring in a bird. And uh, that's what I wanted to say is that, I mean, if I would not have bought all those birds um, that didn't do well for me, I also wouldn't get the birds that were really helpful. Can you understand what I mean? Understand, yep. That makes good sense. Maybe you can, uh, can you go to the video? Uh, can you go back to the, where the surface sure. where a lot of videos are seen? Yep, uh, sure. To the Swiss Bocci Maestro or something like this. Um, oh, um, to the actual YouTube video? Yeah, there you can see lots of, um, uh, there were there are lots of good um, 
pictures of at the end, I think. I'm not sure. Of nice birds that were just before after the, the videos were taken just before or after a show. I don't remember, but they are good, good uh, pictures of nice birds in show condition. On let me share this this one here at the top or the second one. Uh, the best, um, best show watch is the Swiss Mochi Meister of flying. Maybe that you the. Uh, no, 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 go back, go back. The Daniel Lutolf, the end way. This one here? Yes, wait. I think that one. Oh, yeah. oh what? what? Uh, I actually haven't got permission to be able to play those, obviously, because they're from oh, Budget okay. Yeah. Oh, leave. Oh, uh, Budget Planet is a friend of mine. Hey, uh, I, I, 100% you get the permission. Well, as long as you're sure. <laughs> on the, I'm 100% sure, 100%. Okay. I don't want to end up in trouble. Um, all right, let me press play on this. I will invite you. I will visit you in the, in the, if you have to go to prison, I come to visit you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you want to go Just to the end of this, you said? Uh, maybe, I mean, we can go to the, we, or just when you at the beginning you see the maybe people wants to see quickly the yeah that's these are the pictures that bird is still alive uh he's a 2018 cock and he still breeds uh but at the at the beginning of the video can, you can see my setup or we can uh, we can try to go afterwards into the um into the breeding room and i can try to show you a few pictures but as i told you it only works in the that was the swiss national winner that one and that bird you know it's he was really the whole year he was looking nice and always in top condition and uh, of course uh, um, yeah that a bird that has this uh, feature is uh, yeah you should get as many offsprings of it that bird is also still alive, like green talk, still breeding well, still, <laughs> he always needs hens with big spots because he, yeah, as I told you at the beginning, small spots is often connected with um, um, nice face and, nice, and big spots is connected with um, um, not so nice faces. And while we're looking at those, I, I will put a call out, obviously, to everyone who's on the Zoom at the moment and just ask if there are any more questions you want to fire through on the chat. Um, we've had some come through to me directly, and I think Daniel's answered them all. Um, I did just send a message out to everybody if there's any more questions we have for Daniel before we wrap things up. Um, we are about to hit nine o'clock. So looks like I've got one just came through. Um, Two questions we have, Daniel. Would you breed with birds with no tails? Yeah, I do, but um, don't pair it to another bird with no tail. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it, it depends. If I have a cock with no tail and some of his youngsters have no tail as well, I stop immediately, completely, finish. Um, if I have from a pair, let's say 13 chicks, and uh, two very best ones have uh, no tail. All the other ones are feather complete. Then why not using it? Um, but I, um, and also if you have a bird that was suffering on a French molt and his tail uh, get lost and they don't grow back, uh, that's also um, not a, a problem. You birds with French molt. Um, can be used for breeding i'm sure that's something it's not in the genetic french mold is nothing it's a virus it, it has nothing to do with a genetic default okay uh, so yes you can use them but another question, don't, pair, another don't, question pair, through, don't pair them together don't pair them no together. Tail, no tail. So can you stop quickly sure hang on uh, there this gray cock on the right, 
he had a huge, he just died. Um, he had a huge influence on my birds. He was not a big bird, but very, very beautiful to look at. And um, yeah, I think it's more important to have a bird that has the perfect um, proportion, even if it's small. He was a small bird also in the hand. There was not much muscle or body weight, but he was extremely beautiful. And uh, I was not very, I didn't get, I wanted to get more youngsters, I, but I got one and they had a good influence on, he's the father or grandfather of that cinnamon gray green you've seen at the beginning that looks so nice. I think, oh, I'm not sure, father or grand, grandfather he is to that one. Okay. Okay, go on. Um, next question we had down there. What kind of treatments do you do for your own birds outside of just the exalt? Do you give them doxycycline, for instance, before they're breeding, or amoxicillin, tihydrate for, um, you know, the the dead in shell or anything like that? What treatments do you do for your own birds? Nothing. <laughs> just the exalt. Uh, well, the exalt I'm doing since a few years, but that that just against mites and then have no other function. Um, I'm, you, I'm working with Dr. Marcellus Birkle from Germany, and um, he convinced me to use probiotic and to stimulate the immune system instead of um, using antibiotics and destroying um, um, the certain bacteria. Do you understand the, the yes. difference between? destroying bad bacteria or supporting good bacteria. I think also when you, I, I used to work for a long time as a teacher and you have, as a teacher, you have two possibility. Uh, you have a very difficult child you have to deal with. And either you can fix on the bad sides that he has, he cannot read well, his behavior is bad and uh, uh, you know, have to focus on the bad things or you can say oh he's a excellent uh, in football he's uh, um, he has a wonderful voice and uh, let's try to support him in the in the, in music you understand um, yes uh, you can have to focus on the bad features or you can have to focus on the on the good features and i try also uh, always also if i when i dealing with anyone i try to uh, fix to be fixed on the on the good features and not on the bad features that okay. makes life more more uh, easy enjoyable um how enjoyable. early can you tell if you have a good chick in the nest well <laughs> Well, I said once that uh, even when I put on the rings, I know whether it's uh, super bird or not. That's uh, and the, the rumor is going now. Lutov can see when he puts a ring on whether it's a show winner or not. That that's nonsense. But when you when you the the the, the size of the feet, the, my younger daughter that was here before uh, saying hello and goodbye, she had to go back to school. At the moment, she's 11 and a half years old and she's growing enormously. I mean, I'm tall as well. I'm one, nine, I'm one meter 93, uh, but I have quite small uh, le um, um, uh, um, legs. I don't know what legs. Uh, my shoes are quite small comparing to the size I have. But what I want to say is that um, the, the little daughter, she she's getting very big feet at the moment and they grow they grow and she always has to buy new shoes and uh, it's the same with um, with budgies when you have um, a budgie and you have to put the ring on uh, I have every year a few birds that I was not able to put the ring on anymore because I miss them but if it's a good bird I keep him and it doesn't matter if it's a bad one it doesn't matter either but what I say is that when you put the ring on, on a bird, you can see whether it has a big bone structure and whether it becomes a big bird. And uh, that's what, what I wanted to say. And if, you, if a bird has very little 
um, dry feed. You have to take it away from the parents. Something is not going well. Maybe that bird you have to treat with some antibiotics. I use uh, black paste that uh, has a tetracycline inside. And if a bird, I can see something is wrong with a baby, I try to give from that black paste and then uh, try to put the bird into another box. Uh, yeah, that's uh, because when the feed is very small, then something is not um, going well with the de development of the bird. Okay. Um, so one, that one video was taken. Question. That video was taken three and a half years ago, I think, and some of the birds, that one as well, uh, are still in the breeding. Not all of them. Some are dead. Some are um, that one is sold, uh, but uh, some of them are still. It's it's also funny for me to see them. Or mm -hmm. I have, of course I already have sons and or grandsons of them. And uh, I can realize or I can recognize certain features that they had. Sorry, okay. I interrupt you. No, no, you're fine. The, the last question that I had on the chat um, thus far, um, Chris Slaughter had asked, how old are your birds when you first pair them up? Normally eight, nine, 10, 11 months, but, but they're always exceptions. Uh, last year or two years ago, I'm not sure, I had um, um, a cinnamon gray green baby hen, and she started to lay eggs in the in the flight of the baby flight, and I took the eggs out and um, um, I put it to any pairs, and they were fertile. So uh, and she was uh, mating with uh, sky blue, and that was also a baby cock. So these were really babies uh maybe uh, 10 11 12 weeks old and um uh, i know that in nature birds can budgies can breed very very early they can start breeding with 10 11 12 weeks before the big mold starts but these are the exceptions i think sometimes you have hens that wants to breed with five six seven months then yeah then let them breed but average age i would say is eight nine months for hens and for cocks also there are exception i have cocks that are mating with five six months and they are fertile but most of my cocks are used 10 11 12 months out old some on some cocks you have to wait one and a half or two two years until they get fertile but that's also again exceptions okay Excellent. Um, I think that's all the questions that have come through on the chat. Is there anything else you wanted to share with the group before we uh, we sign off and say thank you for the sharing your time with us? Well, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm not sure how it works afterwards. We can try. We can. Uh, it's now one and a half hours. Um, we can try um, in the bird room how it looks like. The signal outside will be good. Uh, I can show you the bird room from the outside. Inside, it's um, you will see soon that the, uh, the signal is getting weaker. But we can try and uh, yeah. Oh, what shall I say? We can have a quick look outside. Maybe you can use the video somehow. Hello. Um, to show people where we live. That's our house, that's our car, that's the bird room. Um, roof made solar Maybe now it's very windy, hot and windy. We can quickly go in. We are making a new, um, a new nice garden. My shoes. Yeah, that's how it looks like. That's these are the baby flights. Uh, these birds are born uh, about three, four months ago, and yeah, they are slowly growing. Oh, I can do it like this. Okay. In a few months, he will look like a real budgie. 
Um, yeah, just to explain quickly, where it's like this, there are uh, a few bigger babies in. Four here, for example. I leave the, that the air can come in. I make like this. So everywhere where it's like this, there are babies in and uh, that it, it stays cool, uh, not cool, that it stays um, um, not too sticky in the bird room, in the nest box. And when you have this here, that means there are small babies um, and Yeah, they look okay. Just to check. And uh, to explain what I meant before, if I want to see something, I don't touch them. I, but instead of touching, I use like this to see are they well fed, if it is okay. Good. That's a melanistic spangle, a nice hen. I'm not sure whether you have this mutation in Australia already as well. I like them a lot. It's a golden face melanistic spangle. Um, well, that's the bird room. That's the kitchen to prepare and clean everything. Here you see everywhere. Um, that means small babies with this, big babies, big babies, small babies, small babies. Um, that's how it's also easy for me if I make the check-in in the morning and the evening to know where I have to look, um, whether the birds are okay. So you save time when you have a certain system. When you just, when you want to open every cage, you lose too much time. And if you just can, uh, that one just arrived. So that means I go and get a knife. And uh, yeah, tonight I know exactly, okay, I need there to check because it's a knife. I wanted to show you a few birds, but uh, yeah, we have to do that somehow. And next time they all in the breeding boxes and uh, yeah we have the European show in two weeks time and some of those birds will be used for um, showing I hope you will see. Well it's uh, the light has turned off so um, yeah, the bird are many birds. Oops, it's, I told you it's windy. The birds went into the nest box. It's not easy to see them right now. They are in the sleeping mode. It's uh, yeah, there's a nice one outside. Yeah, I think that's enough. Ah, I can go quickly downstairs as well. If you want to add that. I will see now it's, um, uh, it's dark. Uh, because, yeah, as I told you, it's sleeping time. I have to put on the the lights. This here is for heating in winter time and now it's cooling uh, the, the ground here. It's, uh, I call it down on 18 degrees. Well, it's still, um, what is it now, 24 degrees, but the ground is on 18 degrees. And uh, yeah, the birds are sleeping. I have to wake them up, but uh, very soon they will be very noisy. Yeah.
Thanks, Troy, and thank you, Daniel. That was fantastic. I'm sure we all learned something very valuable tonight. So, Troy, thanks for tonight. Great job. Um, uh, just, just so everyone's aware, there was a lot of preparation that went into tonight. Troy's probably spent quite a few hours prepping for tonight, trying to get the right questions and doing a lot of research on some of the stuff that Daniel's presented in the last couple of years so that uh, he had the right angles to ask the right questions. So on behalf of everyone, Troy, thank you for the time you put in because um, I don't think we realise how much, how many hours you put in beforehand to, um, to, to getting this up and running for us. So thank you very, very much. Um, and that's really it. So um, obviously when we... Uh, when we're able to secure our next um, meeting, we'll let everybody know. But um, yep, thank you all for joining in. Please um, uh, spread the word. And um, obviously this will pop up on the YouTube channel the next day or two. So those that couldn't make it tonight have the opportunity to watch it. But um, the good thing about the live stuff is that you get to ask questions and you get to be a little bit interactive. So appreciate it all. And thank you very much, everyone.